Patriotic tunes like this one were hugely popular during World War I. At the Library of Congress, you can find sheet music for thousands of other songs from the Great War, including two written by Nashville women. It's a war that people do need to know about. It uh, brought us into the 20th century, and in a sense, we lost our, our innocence as a nation, and it totally changed politics, the culture, it changed our history in a, in a huge way. And I think if you're not familiar with the facts surrounding the First World War, you won't clearly understand later wars, such as the Second World War. Dr. Lisa Boudreau is a curator of military history at the State Museum, using war relics ranging from a captured German cannon to Sergeant York's Medal of Honor. She has been working on new exhibitions for the 100th anniversary of the end of the war to end all wars. You'll hear these stories and a lot more on this episode of Nashville Retrospect. Welcome to the Nashville Retrospect Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Forkham. I am also the editor and publisher of the Nashville Retrospect, a monthly newspaper full of old news stories from and new essays about Nashville's past. Our November 2018 issue is, as usual, chock full of interesting stories. Thanksgiving Day in 1904, children being taught to use the telephone in 1955, the opening of a Fisk University time capsule in 1972, the first high school football clinic bowl in 1950, the terrorizing of black voters by the Ku Klux Klan during the 1868 presidential election, and much more. But we also have devoted many column inches to Nashville's reaction to the end of World War I, which makes the November issue a good companion to this podcast. City whistles announce news to eager public, reads one headline. Nashville goes wild with joy, reads another, describing the thousands of people who celebrated victory in the city streets. In contrast, though, a Nashville, Tennessean story reported a record number of Nashville deaths from influenza at 429 for the month of October 1918, and another featured a letter from a Nashvillian on the front lines of the war who describes the battlefield trenches as graves. To see article excerpts and photographs from some of these and other stories, visit our Facebook page. You can pick up the latest issue of The Retrospect for only a dollar at local grocery stores and markets. And at NashvilleRetrospect.com, you can order subscriptions and even back issues. So if you're new to the retrospect or skipped an issue, check out our webpage to see what you've missed. The date of November 11th is today celebrated as Veterans Day, but from 1918 until 1954, it was known as Armistice Day, for it was on that day in 1918 that the armistice ending the First World War was signed on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the end of the Great War, so it's an appropriate time to take a look around town for reminders of a time when Nashville went wild with joy on first learning about the armistice. Nashville memorials range from a bronze statue in Centennial Park right by busy West End Avenue to a book titled Davidson County Women, of the World War, which you can read about in the October issue. By far the most dramatic reminder is the War Memorial Building, which was completed in 1925 and is located downtown by the state capitol. The central courtyard of this neoclassical state building features an enormous statue of victory. Surrounding the statue are bronze plaques listing the names of 3,400 Tennesseans who died in the war. But there's much more to see at the War Memorial Building Many of the surviving soldiers of the war brought back souvenirs. These items would form the basis of what is today the military branch of the State Museum, located in the basement of the War Memorial Building. At that time, in 1919, they didn't have a place where they could keep their uh, war relics, and this was a common thing that was done at the time for people to bring back uh, things that they'd found on the battlefield as as, as memories, tokens of memory. Dr. Lisa Boudreau is the senior curator of military history at the State Museum. She is also the author of Bodies of War, 
a book about the politics surrounding the creation of World War I cemeteries in America and Europe. When the soldiers came back, it was actually women, uh, women uh, from the Centennial Club, who initiated a grassroots effort to uh, build a memorial. And in that memorial, it would have a functional uh, utilitarian purpose as well, in that it would serve to hold the war relics, the, 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 uh, the memories of the soldiers in terms of their archives and the actual three-dimensional items. They needed a place for the veterans to call their own, where they could meet and uh, display the, the artifacts that they brought back. So in 1925, as you know, the War Memorial was dedicated. The War Memorial building was dedicated, open, brand new. And the first veterans to meet there were Spanish-American War veterans. But by this time, the War Memorial was also housing artifacts from uh, World War I veterans, too. Two men would lead the effort to collect the artifacts from the soldiers. One was John Trotwood Moore, then the state librarian and also his curator, who was George Beerworth. George was a veteran. He initially uh, in, enlisted with the British Army, and he went to France, and he was wounded, and he suffered from post-traumatic stress, as we will call it today. Uh, back then, they called it shell shock. As a form of therapy, George Beerworth built a diorama of the Hindenburg Line, which was where many of the Tennessee World War I soldiers served. And that diorama was, was huge. It filled a whole railroad car. And he and John Trotwood Moore would take it on the road, and it was a way to, uh, to develop interest in uh, a museum. And everywhere they went, people would donate uh, more of their World War I souvenirs. Uh, so Let many me, of the artifacts that are on display right now are those relics that they brought back in the train. Uh, oh, the ones they collected. Yeah, at the, the ones time. they collected. What was the diorama like? Are there any surviving pictures or descriptions of it? That's a great question. Yes, uh, we have a portion of it. It was actually huge, as I said. It fit into a railroad car. There is a sample of that diorama on display now at the War Memorial Building in the Military Branch Museum. You can see it today, and he made it with paper mache and little twigs, and he actually built uh, the, the houses, uh, and, and he did it to scale. He was an engineer, so he did it specifically according to his own survey of the Western Front, so it is to scale. And are there miniature troops and, and equipment? Yeah, well, there, there was a lot more to the diorama, and we're, we're not sure what happened to it. We'd love to find it. Uh, but this is about a third of it, I would say, and it shows uh, little ambulance trucks going across the front, and it shows what the trenches actually look like, the zigzag pattern. Uh, it showed uh, the, the no man's land and uh, craters where the artillery shells would have gone off, and uh, it's very realistic. It's wonderful. It's, it's one of the greatest, my favorite things from the old museum, yeah. It used to be that these items were displayed only at the Military Branch Museum, but with the recent opening of the new State Museum on Rosa Parks Boulevard, you can see many of them there now. Not only are there permanent exhibits relating to the war, there is also a temporary display titled Tennessee and the Great War, a centennial exhibition. A lot of the artifacts are still on display at the Military Branch Museum in the War Memorial, but we took some of them out and brought them here for display in the new museum. And surprisingly, they include not just American artifacts that were used by our own troops, but uh, German cannon, grenades, firearms. We have a, uh, a German grenade thrower that's on display now. And one of the artifacts that seems to be of most interest to our visitors is a shield that a machine gunner wore, a very heavy steel chest piece of armor that was supposed to protect him. But in fact, it shows three places, distinct holes, where the shrapnel went through the armor. And so, unfortunately, I doubt that he would have survived that. But it, it's one of the more interesting pieces that still survives. And was that an American? 
Uh, no, that was that a, was German. That was a German piece of armor, a chest armor that a machine gunner would have worn. It was kind of like a like an armadillo. It would have had several layers of protection, and this was just the shell that would have gone over his chest. Obviously, it didn't work. You've got to obviously spend a lot of time with the artifacts and researching them. Are there any that stand out to you? That Well, again, the cannon is one of my favorites because I saw it in its original condition and I saw how bad it looked and how wonderful it looks now. And it was donated to us from uh, the Mountain View, the Mountain Home, Soldier's Home in John- near Johnson City. And we brought it back to uh, to Nashville, and we sent it to Kentucky to have it conserved. It was a project that took over two and a half years, and it, we finally uh, have it now on display. And it was completely uh, restored back to a serviceable condition. We don't intend to fire it, but uh, I expect it probably could be fired. Um, but it, it's... It's just amazing to see this piece that it was so long out in the open, and then it's now finally brought back to its war, pristine war condition. And it, it actually suffered uh, shell damage. It, it shows on it pieces where shrapnel went through the metal of the can, of the cannon, and uh, it, it would have taken a six-man crew. It was highly mobile, which is what made it such a popular piece of artillery during the World War One for the Germans. And it would it would have taken six men to pull it across the battlefield. We tried to explain to people where the uh, soldiers would have sat and how it would have been transported. So it was in f- displayed outside in front of the home. I'm just curious. Yes, it was, it was actually, just like you see it. VFW is where they put a piece exactly. of artillery. Exactly, it had been outside. The wheels were all rotted from it. It had been sitting on the cemetery a lot, I think. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the history, but uh, word of mouth uh, has told us, and those who have known that piece for years have told us that that was brought back. And uh, it's not surprising because so many pieces of artillery were brought back to Tennessee. And at one time, they were actually divvied up and given to throughout the state to various counties. And uh, we have a list at the museum to show where a lot of the war relics went. I asked Lisa what she hoped would be accomplished by displaying such relics of the war. Well, what we hope to do is to give people a feel for what it was like being a soldier in the trenches, uh, what it was like having uh, never been out of Tennessee, and then you find yourself in a trench in France. So we do this through interpreting uh, the firearms that they would have used, what they wore. We've got a number of uh, uniforms on display, then the weapons that they used. And uh, also for women, too. We, we were uh, eager to make sure that women were represented. This was the first time that women joined uh, men on the battlefield, and in this case as nurses, both for the Red Cross and for the Army Nurse Corps. So they're represented here. It's a way to honor those who served because the war memorial plaques in the courtyard list 3,400 names of those who served. And there's a woman mentioned there, Elizabeth Wiseman. She was a nurse, the only woman named on the plaques. Uh, And she died of the flu. And uh, we we like to make sure that women are represented too. And and that's what's so exciting, Alan, is when it all comes together, the three-dimensional pieces, the, the visuals, whether it's a headstone or the actual uniform that he wore. For example, we have General Lawrence Tyson's uniform that he wore in the Span Am War. And then, of course, he was a general in World War I for the 30th Division, and we have his son's uniform. So we, we, there's such a wonderful legacy, military legacy for service in the state of Tennessee. But when it all comes together like that, it's just, to me as a historian, very exciting. Of course, the artifacts are only interesting because of the people who used and collected them. A number of Tennesseans, both famous and not, are represented in exhibits at both museums. One of the things that I enjoyed about this exhibition is the people, the personalities that come out of it, in addition to the nurses, in addition to those that we already know about, like Alvin York, 
Uh, we have a, a Dr. Albert Harris, and uh, we have a whole collection of his personal items that he had in his trunk when he was in France. And he went over with Vanderbilt with the base hospital. They were one of the first to go to France. So as a doctor for the Vanderbilt Base Hospital, Albert Harris, who was actually from Glen Levin, and he served, we have his uniform and uh, items that he used. And you can really see the difference in the uniforms when they're on display. The officers, like Dr. Albert Harris' uniform, compared to our a aviator, Phil Campbell. In World War I, you didn't have to be an officer to be an aviator. And his uniform is also on display. And you can tell how the quality uh, of the government-issued wool uniform doesn't even hardly match up to an officer's uh, higher-grade quality uh, uniforms. And I think we, we make the case that not everybody went overseas. We've got this uniform for Chester Myers, and he served out in the West Coast with the Spruce Division, and they were sort of like lumberjacks, and they cut the wood that made the planes, the spruce, the light balsam wood that's used in the production of aircraft. We've got his uniform, we've got a uh, number of items that his family donated to us. We also have interactives, which will take those who have the interest uh, a little deeper into the details. They can research people like Grant Shockley, who served with the, an African American from Sparta, who served with the 92nd Buffalo Soldiers in the Meuse Argonne. And unfortunately, Grant Shockley, Private Grant Shockley, didn't make it back from France. And his body is still buried over there. But we focus on him in the interactives, along with a number of other Tennessee heroes. Undoubtedly, Tennessee's most famous war hero is Alvin C. York, one of the most highly decorated Army soldiers from World War I. Not only does he have a statue on the grounds of the Capitol, he was even portrayed by Gary Cooper in the 1941 Warner Brothers movie, Sergeant York. 102, 218, 102. York, Alvin C. Anything wrong with it? I'm sure he's a fine rifle gun. I thought maybe you might have some conscientious objections to it. No, sir, I ain't. Careful you don't kill anybody with it till you get to France. Thanks, man. Here you are, York. The York collection is wonderful here. We, of course, have most, if not all, nearly all of the medals. We have his Medal of Honor. We have his Croix de Guerre with Palm. And those, all those medals will be on display. They've recently been conserved, and they will be on display right now, the Croix de Guerre and the Medal of Honor, which, of course, is the highest medal awarded to any soldier in the United States. And uh, we have that. Um, some of the souvenirs that Alvin sent home to Gracie York are on display. His uh, pen knife. We, we have his tunic that he wore after he was demobilized. He was, of course, in the National Guard, and he wore the uniform in the service of the government after he was demobilized back in Tennessee. We have the Mauser that he confiscated from a German officer when he was in the Mirzargon that day on October 8, 1918, the event for which he was given the Medal of Honor. Uh, oh, we have his identity tags, too, which I think is really thrilling that we have those. And a whistle that he wore, whether or not he used it on that day, we don't know, but we have that. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we have the Alvin York collection here. We share some of that collection with the York site, in fact, the Medal of Honor will be going on display at the York site in November, and I think that will be the first time that it's ever actually been on display in his hometown, which I'm very excited about that. The 3,400 names listed on the plaques at the War Memorial do not include everyone who died during the war. Hundreds more could be added. Just who qualifies and who doesn't is the question. Combat fatalities from World War I, about the same as Vietnam, uh, roughly 55,000, but that figure is doubled when we look at the overall war casualty, uh, American casualty figures from World War I, which takes you up into about 100,000. If you consider flu victims, those who were lost at sea, those who just disappeared, but largely it was uh, disease, and most of those were flu. Did they count any death as a 
casual of, of war, even if it was from flu? Or? That's a great question. Yeah, they uh, they actually did, and uh, it's interesting because so many families were concerned that although their loved one didn't make it over to uh, the battlefield, he may have died on the ship going over. Families were concerned that that uh, that he was still uh, considered a hero, and this was a big concern. Uh, disease was a primary killer in other wars that Americans fought, but for World War I, with so many having been lost through the flu, the Surgeon General issued a report on this too, a number of reports, and, and this was a huge concern to the War Department. But they insisted that regardless of how that soldier died, he was American, he was fighting in the war, regardless of whether he made it over there or not, he was still a hero, and his death counted as uh, a casualty of the war. But any time you start talking about war casualties, it's, pardon the pun, it's a, it's a real minefield because you can, uh, you have so many parameters that you can name. Well, do we count those who were specifically lost on the battlefield? Do we talk about flu? Do we talk about those who may have died three days later? I mean, how do you distinguish what is an actual loss and and you I don't think that you you can and uh, we still don't know why there were only 3400 names listed on the war memorial there's a, an effort about now to to have new names inscribed on the wall it definitely needs to be updated because we know that the number for Tennessee was greater than 3400 how much greater? Where, where, where is the estimate now? We use the figure anywhere from 3,800 to 4,000. Wow. That's yeah, but again, you have to say, now, which parameters right. where are we talking about? Where do we draw the line exactly? After the armistice was signed, there was still much work to be done, and some Americans did not return home for months and even years. To me, the centennial continues beyond uh, November 11th. Uh, 2018. I mean, that is the what we consider the traditional 100-year mark. As we all know, the armistice was declared on the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. So that's the official day that we will commemorate. But actually, the World War I experience went on way into 1919 because the soldiers didn't return they weren't demobilized back to the United States until much later. Your African-American soldiers returned even later than the others because they were used in support roles. And also they helped to bury the dead. And many of the repatriated war dead did not arrive, arrive back in the United States until way into 1921. And families would have had an opportunity to choose whether or not they wanted their war dead returned. And at the same time, as we talk about in the Centennial Exhibit, uh, cemeteries, national cemeteries, were being established in France, Belgium, and one in England. And so uh, that was still ongoing throughout 1919, and that's represented there as well. If the 100th anniversary inspires you to visit the names in the War Memorial Courtyard, you will find yourself close to the entrance of the Military Branch Museum, which is kind of hidden on the Union Street side of the building. And though it's a basement space, it's a basement with a storied past. It used to be the home of the State Museum itself. Many people have fond memories of it, going in and seeing an eclectic collection, whether it be a swordfish or a polar bear or uh, James Robertson's moccasins or the mummy. Dan Pomeroy is the chief curator and director of collections at the State Museum. It existed pretty much as what we would today call open storage, along with military pieces here and there. Now, the people who had been there, been managing the museum, were wonderful people, and it was a labor of love. And I have to particularly mention Fred Estes, who was a World War I veteran. Matter of fact, he had been... Uh, severely wounded in the mustard gas attack. And he became director of the museum, and he did so many wonderful things with not much of any funding, any support from the state, and just did and saved and kept this museum intact. 
uh, until he literally died on the floor of the museum in 1969. Uh, people like Fred Estes, you just can't say enough good things for what they did. I wish he could be here right now and see what this museum looks like. After the death of Fred Estes, Senator Douglas Henry and Representative John Bragg would lead an effort to fund improvements in the State Museum. Over the next few years, its collection would be greatly expanded and ultimately housed in the lower levels of the then-new James K. Polk Building. Dan Pomeroy was hired to acquire new items for that museum, which opened in 1981. We knew we were going to tell the story of Tennessee history and what the Polk Building. So what do you do with the War Memorial Building? It's the War Memorial Building. It was built by the people of Tennessee as a memorial to those who served in the armed forces. So that's when clearly the decision was made, this needs to be a military museum. I asked Dan if the new state museum, which now has many of the state's war-related artifacts, would replace the military branch museum. It is our ardent hope that it will not only continue to exist, but we will expand so that we can tell the story of Vietnam, tell the story of Korea. We weren't able to do that. Uh, uh, Desert Storm, there are so many stories that we need to tell. Probably need to tell, say something about Fort Campbell just down the road and the 101st Airborne. So uh, we, we hope that it's going to not only stay but grow and improve and be redesigned. But uh, the decision makers are far upstream, f certainly from me. I highly recommend visiting both museums, which have amazing exhibits about the war. I asked Lisa where she got information for these exhibits. What's interesting and what helped us to put this uh, display together was that the Tennessee State Library and Archives has a wonderful gold star record. A digit, they've recently digitized, and that was tremendous help. I'm so glad that John Trotwood Moore initiated that project in 1919. Uh, I think it was completed in 21. And I used it for my book, Bodies of War. It was a tremendous source of information on not just the soldier, but how he died and uh, correspondence with the family when they tried to find his body in order to decide whether or not to repatriate the body or to leave it buried overseas. And all that information is in the Tennessee uh, Gold Star records, which are an invaluable source. The Gold Star records are part of an effort uh, for the Tennessee State Library and Archives to kind of record and memorialize Tennessee in service during World War I. Allison Griffey is a librarian at the Tennessee State Library and Archives who worked on the Gold Star records. So this effort was started almost immediately after the war ended, I think about three or four months later, by John Trotwood Moore, who was our state librarian and archivist at the time. Um, so what he did was he sent out these surveys uh, to different family members. Deceased soldiers' families sent back questionnaires, and they became part of the Gold Star Records. Um, whereas there were also these questionnaires for living veterans of the war, and those became a separate collection, um, and these guys would have been represented by a blue star. So that's kind of the difference between the two collections, but the Gold Star collection is definitely the one that stands out in terms of range of material and uniqueness of items, because uh, when John Trotwood Moore had started this collection, he really wanted people to send in correspondence and artifacts and ephemera related to that soldier's experience in the war uh, so that he could use these items uh, for the new building that he was lobbying to have built where he wanted to put archives material. And that is actually the war memorial that is across the road from where we currently are at the library and archives. So his initial plan and what he actually sent out in letters to these grieving families um, told them that this war memorial was going to be built and what he 
hoped for that building was that uh, he could display these soldiers' materials in it forever because, of course, the memorial was being built as a memorial to these World War I soldiers. So that was his initial plan, and a lot of people really responded positively to that. They sent in sometimes the only picture of their you know, relative that they had. The service flags, with their gold stars and blue stars, became an important part of the home front experience during the war. The gold star distinction comes from service flags, which were basically just um, usually handmade little uh, flags that people would hang up in their windows of their homes or even outdoors or in a banner at a church even. Uh, each star represented a soldier in service or a loved one in service if it was at the home. So a gold star would represent someone who had actually died while in service, while a blue star would represent someone living who was in service. Um, there was actually a woman, uh, her name was Sue Hallowell Adams, and she um, was notable in Davidson County because she actually had seven blue stars on her flag. You know, that's very unusual for the state, and they all actually ended up living through the war, which is also unusual. In a scrapbook, which is the John uh, William Overton scrapbook, so he was obviously a part of the notable Overton family, um, and he uh, was a track star before he ended up enlisting in, I believe, the Marines. And in that scrapbook, we actually have a hand-stitched or possibly sewing machine-stitched flag, which is a gold star flag. There are thousands of items in the Gold Star records from all over the state of Tennessee. For example, in a letter to his sister who lived in Nashville, Harold Goodwin wrote about a German artillery shell exploding close to him. The shock knocked me down and it scared me horribly, he wrote. My first sensation was one of wonder at being alive. My next was of disgust at being shell-shocked on my first shell, for I was so shaky and nervous I could hardly pick up my helmet. I decided I had better get in a dugout but my plans to take cover were ruined by the calls for help from the fellows who were hit. Goodwin was gassed to death in August 1918. The one that really stands out to me is James Simmons Timothy, and that's really because um, he was the first Davidson County officer to die during World War I and also the first to be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. So um, he was born in Nashville and he attended school in Nashville. He was Catholic, um, so he attended some of those schools. Um, he ended up going to Vanderbilt as well. So there's a write-up about him and the Vanderbilt alumnus from that time. Um, so he ended up enlisting with the 6th Regiment of the Marines, and he traveled over to France. And when he started his service, he was gassed, I believe, within the first couple days of really being on the front lines. And then after that, he refused to go to the hospital to get treatment. Um, and then about two weeks later, he ended up dying in a bomb explosion. Um, so one of the reasons he received that Distinguished Service Award was because um, he had refused treatment and had pressed on um, to kind of, you know, help lead his unit. Uh, he was a first lieutenant um, and had been promoted, I think, before he went out, pretty, but pretty soon after he ended up, you know, dying from that. So um, his death really stuck with Nashville as a community, um, and a lot of churches ended up having memorial services for him here, uh, Catholic and otherwise, um, you know, other denominations as well. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, the people of Nashville really did mourn his death as a community, and he was kind of uh, one of those early heroes that they lifted up. Um, there is a tree planted in Centennial Park in his honor uh, by the Catholic children, and it is still there. It has a huge plaque in front of it. It is marked. Yeah, and it was planted in 1919. Allison worked with a team of people to put the Gold Star records online. In the course of her work, she read every item in the collection, which left a definite impression on her. Basically, the whole time I was reading this collection, I had the very strange perspective of thinking, well, this guy's exactly kind of my age. If this had happened in 2018, this person would be my age, and this is what would be happening to them. You know, they would 
have been drafted or they would have enlisted and gone over and done this. And these guys are having experiences in their 20s and sometimes in their teens that I cannot imagine even slightly having, partially, of course, because it's a century later, but also mostly because the, the horrors of what they went through are just intense and crazy. And you know, you get really attached to some of them that you have a lot of correspondence for and you always know the ending. It's always the same. I mean, the most tragic thing about this war is there's really just, and probably with any war, there's just no rhyme or reason to who lived, really. You can read the craziest accounts of these guys who faced 17 Germans with nothing but a knife, you know, and lived. And then you can read about a guy who was walking on a ship and slipped and hit his head and just never woke up again. It's like anything with life. It seems very random. But to have it all laid out there in front of you, it, it can be really difficult to read some of these guys' stories and see like what they went through and how terrifying it was to be fine in training camp one day and then the next day to wake up with a fever. The next thing you see is the telegram telling their family that they've died. And how would you like for us to transport their body? <laughs> or overseas telling them they've died and then promising to transport their body, but then getting a letter after the war saying they've lost it. And so you see all of this in the collection. Yes. The the collection is just full of, I, I think the actually the telegrams are maybe um, the most uh, poignant because they're so succinct. It was really personal, honestly, by the end of it. I really feel like I got to know some of these guys pretty well. Um, and I'm always excited when somebody comes in who's related to one of them. That's really fun for me to get to talk about, you know, a specific person in the collection and what we have of theirs and how we got it and how they can use it. And if, of course, if they want to see it, we pull it for them so they can. There were other positive aspects to her research, including what she learned about the reaction to the war on the Nashville home front. For example, the work of women's clubs began even before America entered the war. One club that kind of sticks out to me uh, is a club called the Query Club, which was a women's literary society. This Query Club had a member who had traveled to France and was actually there when the war broke out in 1914. So she kind of saw things firsthand. She saw French troops mobilizing. She was helping women organize um, and send out hospital supplies. So when she came back, she actually had the club start sending out those items and organizing you know, relief efforts and raising money for French orphans and all kinds of things like that. And one of the women who was also a member of that club was Sue Hallowell Adams, the woman who had seven sons in service later on when the war began. So there were some people who were active in doing things before that started, but then once the war, once the United States entered the war, that really exploded. So that book that you mentioned, uh, Davidson County Women in the World War, is a really great resource that documents what women were doing in Nashville at that time. In that book, there are 44 white women's clubs represented, and there are 10 black women's clubs represented in their efforts during the war. So these women's clubs did all kinds of things. There was, of course, the American Red Cross had chapters here. The YWCA had chapters. And they did all kinds of things like having knitting clubs to help you know, make garments that they could send overseas or to even just the camps because... Honestly, when the United States entered the war, they really weren't all that prepared to have enough facilities to train all of the men that ended up being drafted and enlisting because they had a huge response. Even, even on the home front, people were suffering from things like influenza and you know training uh, accidents and all kinds of things like that. So these women were aware of that. Obviously, they were corresponding even more so with the people that hadn't gone overseas. And so they knew that the need was great. So they really stepped up um, and tried to provide things like bedding and garments and hospital dressings and just raising money, you know, just trying to give whatever they could. 
in addition to filling all of the jobs that had obviously been opened by these men leaving. A lot of these women's clubs obviously represent you know, people who had more money and more time to give, um, but that's not exclusively so. There were definitely uh, women who were, you know, more middle class and even some poorer women who are represented in these clubs um, just by the pure fact of wanting to contribute to the war effort and, you know, do, do their bit, as they would say. One place where Nashville women did their bit was at the gunpowder plant in Old Hickory. It's the largest munitions plant in the world at that time, so obviously it had significant impact. So the smokeless powder would have been used as part of ammunition during the war. There's actually a really great newsletter called the Old Hickory News that was produced by the plant, DuPont Engineering Plant, and we have copies of it here on microfilm. Those are really great to read through if you ever are just interested in learning more about the culture of the place. So obviously they built up communities there. Women and men had their own dormitories. Some married couples got to live together. I don't think all of them. Obviously they were also segregated by race. It's interesting because you see accounts like uh, obituaries, example, for people who are dying that are working there. And so the draft obviously affected men between the ages of 18 to 40 by the end of the war. But um, you'll see like accounts of men working at the factory that are sometimes in their 70s. Like, and that, those are, of course, the white men that you will see represented there. They'll interview these guys and ask, why are you working? You're so old. You should be retired. And they're saying, you know, well, I can't go fight. This is what I want to do. I'm giving back. So you obviously have that happening there as well. But you also have 10,000, more than 10,000 women working there, which is cool. You know, that's a lot of women. A lot of them worked at this place called the Box Factory, and they basically just made boxes for this, the powder and the munitions. And they wore these coveralls, which they called womanalls, because they're for women. <laughs> but their supervisor, somewhat condescendingly, but still a commendation, I guess, said, you know, these women are able to do the work of men just as fast and just as well. So it's a little bit of an admission that women are playing this role in the war and doing things, and they're capable. One woman in particular who worked at the plant seemed to grasp the implications of women proving their worth in such factories. I actually have a cool quote from a woman's uh, diary who we have in our collections. Her name is Lou Cresha Owen. She was in the women's work department in the old Hickory factory powder plant. And she had done a lot of work basically taking care of the women, advocating for them, but then also spying on them. Obviously, uh, she, well, one, espionage was a huge problem. There were obviously a lot of issues with people sneaking into the factory, getting work there, and ending up being spies. So she had a couple of women that she was not sure about. I don't think any of them actually ended up being spies, but of course the spies were found at this powder plant, you would almost be shocked to know that there were no spies there. But also, women were really kind of liberated by this, you know. One, a lot of times, whoever was kind of the primary breadwinner in their lives, or maybe even the person that just kind of had control over, you know, their life, was away. Whether it be their husband, or their father, or a brother or whatever, right? Like these guys were gone. And so that opened up a lot of opportunities for women. One, to travel, for example, to this place. Um, two, to gain new skills, you know, whether it be factory work or clerical. Three, uh, maybe even to just try to start a new life. It, uh, there are a couple of accounts of women being found out as having families that they just left um, to go work at this plant and try to get some money and start over, you know, and of course, when they were found out, they were shipped back <laughs> to wherever they came from, but or it gave them an opportunity to build a new identity, you know, whether they didn't have anything nefarious going on in their background or not. Um, but so she said, 
her sense after the war, she thought that women were going to want change. They were going to want more. So there's a quote from her that says, the arousing of a desire in women to be independent to make their way, live their own lives, and scoff at conventions will leave its effect. And of course, after the war ended, you know, two years later, women got the right to vote. Women weren't the only group gaining opportunities through war work. Surprisingly, there was also a community known as the Mexican Village at the Old Hickory Plant. When I first started learning about the powder plant, I saw a lot of information about the white workers and saw a little information about the black workers, which there were significantly fewer black workers at this plant, actually. But I didn't know anything about the Mexican village is what they called it. Not everyone who worked there was from Mexico. There were also people from Puerto Rico, and there were some Native Americans actually that were working there as well, but they all kind of lived in one village, I guess because due to racial segregation at that time and they didn't know where else to put them, it was kind of like an other category. But it was primarily people from Mexico. Um, because of a, I believe, a 1917 Immigration Act, it was easier for um, Mexican people to uh, enter the United States and work, at least short term, than it was for people from Eastern Europe, for example. So there were some conditions there um, that helped these people actually be able to find work in the United States, and uh, you know, the government actually welcomed them more so than, um, you know, people who were from other countries. So they would be, they wouldn't draft them to go fight, but they might, they would use them for, as workers here. They would hire them to work in yeah, the factories so here. It was easy to get kind of like a, a visa to come over here um, than it, it was for other countries. Um, but actually, a lot of these guys did end up registering for the draft, and that is a really fun thing to look through if you ever just want to look through World War I draft cards in your spare time, which I've spent a lot of time doing. So actually, a lot of these guys, they, they set up their own registration office, which is so interesting because they're not even United States citizens in most cases. But they, they felt compelled, I guess, to register for the draft. All in all, let's see, there were about 1,400 people living in this Mexican village. Children were born there. It really was a community. They were even led by a Mexican man for a while. Uh, his name was Cecilio Gomez, and he organized actually that draft, um, or the draft registration. So he had a Mexican club, they had dances, and they also had the, all of their own things, partially because of segregation, of course. They had their own commissary, their own housing. They had a barber. They had a tailor. It really was a whole community. But eventually, even though this guy had power and was in charge of his own community, which is super inspiring, after a while, the plant authorities thought it'd probably be better for a white man to be in charge, so they were, ended up replacing him. But for a time, it was even a community-led by its own people. Another way in which Nashvillians contributed on the home front was with gardens and canning. Victory gardens, war gardens, I believe I've maybe even seen liberty gardens. All of those words are really big from that time period. They were actually urged to do this by the U.S. Food Administration. So obviously there were shortage issues, food shortage issues during the war. And there were big pushes to have people produce food wherever they could. Um, there was even a U.S. school garden army, and that was for school children. And it basically helped teach them how to farm and encourage them to help their parents, you know, start these gardens anywhere they could. Women would use abandoned lots even, all kinds of things, really just wherever you could grow. And then on top of that, there were these canning centers that women ran, which were actually a government effort, a federal government effort to train women how to can, how to preserve things. Um, one of the most popular ones was actually how to can meat, which I didn't know you could can meat. I, I guess I should because I know there are things like Vienna sausages, but like apparently that was one of the most asked for topics. Canning obviously had existed before this time, but the popularity just surged, and also um, the knowledge between different people, because 
when they were canning, there were even some efforts to donate what they had canned, but you had to follow very, very strict military government guidelines to can them because obviously they were trying to avoid such things as botulism. But it it is interesting because um, there was a huge push to really make your own and do your own um, during this time, even in the more urban places where people hadn't really been doing that as much. So you mentioned uh, botulism. So uh, let's talk about disease because that was a huge huge factor in this time period, Mm -hmm. especially in the casualty numbers for the soldiers. You want to talk about that? Yeah, the influenza epidemic of 1918, of course, is the biggest uh, of the disease, of the epidemics, the issues that people faced. Um, The Gold Star records really do reflect a lot of that as well. More soldiers from the United States ended up dying of disease than dying in battle. So, like I said before, the United States wasn't necessarily completely prepared to accommodate the number of soldiers that they had. So there were issues in camps. They had inadequate housing sometimes. Um, And then, of course, you go overseas, and um, no one cares about hygiene in a trench because you're honestly just trying to stay alive. One of the worst problems of all was the transport ships. So during the war, they obviously had to fit as many men as possible on as many ships as possible to get them overseas, which ended up causing a lot of issues. So men would be crammed, packed into these ships. And then basically, they, if you know, even one or two people had you know, influenza, it just spread like crazy. And they just really weren't ready for it. And then they were out at sea. So there was not a lot you could do. Um, A lot of these men ended up just having to be buried at sea. Even the ones who made it to port um, ended up dying there a lot of times. There's some correspondence in the Gold Star records that actually talks about soldiers being vaccinated in camps and all of the crazy rumors that they were spreading around about what being vaccinated would happen like what would happen if you were vaccinated this one guy wrote home and he was basically telling his parents like you know i'm gonna have to get vaccinated and i'm terrified because there are people dying of these vaccines people losing arms all of these things which might be true i don't know or might have something to do with just the hygiene level and infection But yeah, there were these wild rumors kind of running around camp that, you know, if you got vaccinated, there was a chance you were going to die of getting the shot. And so I'm sure there were people who were even trying to avoid having it in the first place. 50 million people died worldwide during the great influenza epidemic of 1918, according to the National Archives. And though it remains a health concern, we learned valuable lessons about the flu during the war. As we observed the 100th anniversary, Lisa noted that there were other important lessons, too, ones we should take the time to remember. There's a lot of different feeling about this, but so much did come out of it, and specifically in terms of uh, the African Americans. Uh, It was a game changer for African Americans who served overseas and came back, and there's a whole historiography about that part of the war. And also for women, it was a game changer for them, too, because they, like African Americans, experienced what it was like being involved in such an important event and involved in a really active way. And so with that goes expectations that when you return to the United States, you will be credited for your service. So in that sense, it was a game changer. But also in terms of America's role on the global stage, I mean, Tennessee in particular, it it progressed in so many ways. It progressed the nation, it progressed the state. We assumed a whole new role as a as a giant on the world stage after World War One. Of course, it set the stage for World War Two in a in a big way. It's a war that people do need to know about. It uh, brought us into the 20th century, and in a sense, we lost our our innocence as a nation. And it totally changed politics, the culture, 
it changed our history in a, in a huge way. And I think if you're not familiar with the facts surrounding the First World War, you won't clearly understand later wars, such as the Second World War, and why that came along. And of course, that doesn't even take on board the technology uh, that came from the First World War, the aircraft, the uh, medical advances that came out of that war. Uh, there's there's so much about it that's often overlooked that it's a shame, but I hope that more people will have an interest in the war after they come and see the exhibit. Maybe they'll want to read a little bit more, and maybe they'll go back and watch those Alvin York movies and the other World War I movies. Over There was one of the most popular patriotic songs to come out of the war to end all wars. So popular, in fact, that it was revived for World War II. At one Nashville event during the Great War, in November 1917, a large crowd gathered in the Hume Fogg Auditorium to give a send-off to the Vanderbilt Hospital Unit, which was departing for France. Accompanied by the school orchestra, the audience sang the song Over There. In March 1918, the Nashville Tennessean reported that, quote, Within a few days, great bodies of soldiers have been in Nashville. They have paraded the streets, and the air has been filled with the songs over there, and it's a long way to temporary, and other of the patriotic airs sung by the troopers in camp. Even the gold star flag of Johnny Overton, who was mentioned earlier, features the phrase over there. But over there was not the only patriotic air. Today, the Library of Congress has over 14,000 pieces of sheet music relating to World War I, and two of them were written by Nashville women. The song titled Old Glory was first performed at the Orpheum Theater in Nashville in June 1917. Written by Emma Louise Ashford for a unison chorus and piano, the song includes the lines, We have heard the plea of brothers in bondage far across the sea. With hearts of flame we rally to their cry, and striking for freedom the savage hordes defy. Ashford composed hundreds of other songs, including many for Vanderbilt University, where she worked as the superintendent of buildings and grounds. By the way, for more about the Nashville flag called Old Glory, listen to episode 7. The phrase, over the top, was commonly used during the war, initially to describe the soldier's experience of charging out of a battlefield trench. But later the phrase was used to encourage citizens to go over the top in their support of the troops. Nashvillean Marion Phelps used it as the title of her patriotic lyrics, which included the lines, Out of the trenches, everyone into the lines of the cruel Hun. Over the top for liberty, over the top's our battle cry, for future peace, we'll win or die. Phelps, who also wrote the lyrics for other published songs, worked in the editorial department of the Baptist Sunday School Board. You can see the sheet music for these and other World War I songs on the podcast webpage. Unfortunately, we could not locate any recordings of these songs, but stay tuned after the end of the show to hear the entire recording of Over There by Nora Bays. Thank you for listening to this episode of Nashville Retrospect. For more information about the stories you heard, including photographs, see the podcast webpage, which you can find a link to at NashvilleRetrospect.com. You can also email your comments and suggestions to NashRetroShow at gmail.com. This show was written and produced by me, Alan Forkham. Stay tuned for the next one, and in the meantime, don't forget to pick up your copy of The Nashville Retrospect.
Johnny Show.